Again, with endovascular approach for the common femoral artery. So this is mostly focused on legs. Again, we want to make this as interactive as possible. It's a relatively small group, so if you have questions, there's no reason not to, uh, to uh, ask your questions during the presentations, even if need be, and certainly after the presentations. We really do want to get your experience, because the whole purpose of this is to learn from each other. There's no, no one in this room knows more about this than each other. We're all trying to learn from each other, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Thanks very much. Uh, this is a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart, somewhat uh, controversial, but um, I'm going to talk about the endovascular approach for common femoral. But before we do that, I think it's important to understand that for many years, endoterectomy has been the, the gold standard. But I think we have to admit that it's not perfect. There is no free lunch. You know, about longer length of stay, 3.4% mortality in this particular review, and an overall about a 15% incidence combined of morbidity and mortality in the first 30 days. So it's not as quite as benign a procedure as perhaps previously thought. So in the VQI registry, there was another uh, uh, report uh, with over 1,000 patients. And you know, one of the things that was interesting about this was the fact that you can see that the complication rates are obviously a lot smaller than endarterectomy, but still um, uh, not completely a benign procedure. Thankfully, the mortality rate was considerably lower. But the amputation-free survival, the patency and freedom from TLR at one year were really uh, quite um, favorable. Um, so what are the different modalities that we can use from an endo standpoint to try to treat common femoral? You know, we usually try not to put stents there, and one popular option is to use atherectomy. Um, this is uh, initial results from the PESTO study. This is a randomized trial of directional atherectomy in DCB versus uh, common femoral endarterectomy. Uh, this is an ongoing study, but the first interim analysis of the first 60 patients showed that, you know, endo actually hangs in there. Pretty nice results, and in fact, slightly better uh, results in terms of primary patency and TLR rates. So let's just start off with a, with a case presentation. This 60-year-old male with an isolated common femoral lesion and in this particular case, we elected to utilize a combination therapy, initially wanted to make some room for what came next, which was directional atherectomy. So we initially made a little pilot channel with orbital, and then this was followed by uh, directional atherectomy. You can see we got a very nice acute angiographic result, followed by focus force angioplasty, and then a DCB, and then a really nice angiographic result. And I've been following this patient now for eight years, and he remains completely asymptomatic. So I mentioned stenting. Is there any data on stenting for the common femoral? Well, as a matter of fact, there are a couple of studies which have been presented so far. This is the TICO study. This was done in France, 17 vascular surgery centers. So these were vascular surgeons who did this, not cardiologists, just want to make that point. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the results, with primary endpoint being that of perioperative morbidity and mortality in the first 30 days, it actually turns out that the endovascular group did better. And if we look at survival, freedom from uh, TLR, patency, freedom from uh, uh, revascularization of that extremity, you can see that they were all pretty much equal. The other uh, study that was the VMI, this was uh, presented by Kuhn Deleuze a number of years ago, and this, of course, was using the supera. You know, why do we need a supera? Well, sometimes you have really nasty calcified common femorals that look like this. Uh, and in point of fact, the one advantage of a supera for a common femoral is that you can actually put a sheath through it afterwards if you need to access that extremity. And in this particular study, uh, they had a 93% primary patency rate at two years, and a 98% freedom from TLR at two years. No deaths, no amputations, and there was no difference in diabetic versus non-diabetic, claudicans versus CLI, and isolated shaft disease versus bifurcation disease. So let's start off with a, a case that I did uh, earlier this year. Gentleman with lots of comorbidities, terrible operative candidate who had that small ulcer with uh, uh, essentially rest pain, you can see severe nasty calcification there, uh, and the rest of his femoral popliteal uh, vessels are really terribly calcified with basically single vessel runoff. And in this particular case, made a pilot channel 
with orbital followed by seven and then eight millimeter IVL balloons, IVIS based. Unfortunately, that did result in a dissection that we were uh, able to take care of very readily with a seven and a half millimeter superior device. Thankfully, those have become available and, and his claudication resolved and his ulcer healed. Now, we did also employ a similar strategy for his femoral popliteal disease, and in the end, we were able to restore um, inline flow to the foot via the perineal, and he was able to heal his ulcer and have his symptoms resolved. Well, what about um, other modalities? I think a lot of us have become very big fans of using intravascular, ultra, uh, I'm sorry, uh, intravascular lithotripsy for common femoral disease. And, uh, you know, the rationale is that atherectomy predominantly treats intimal disease, and IVL treats the entire wall. Unlike atherectomy, IVL treats all of those vessel layers with very low rates of dissection, need for bailout stenting, and it may potentially help to improve drug penetration. I mean, if the disrupt PAD randomized trial is any indication, there was greater patency in the group that was treated with IVL prior to DCB. And quite frankly, as you saw in these first couple of cases, combination therapy oftentimes can be really effective to get a, a good acute procedural result and less need for stenting and better durability. We actually published a paper last year in CRM um, where we used combinations of IVL and DCB, IVL, DCB, and atherectomy, as well as IVL and atherectomy, and we had an 18-month cumulative TLR rate of about 16%, and so you know, very safe and, and, and very effective in the near term. Study was limited by the fact that this was a small population, was retrospective, not randomized, not core lab adjudicated, and this was using the first generation device that had 150 pulses. And remember back then, we weren't getting reimbursed for IVL, so we were under intense pressure not to use this very expensive balloon. Uh, and of course, we didn't have the eight millimeter devices. We didn't have the L6 device. So we were probably a little bit undersized. Um, and uh, the other thing I mentioned earlier was the use of IVIS. And obviously our Japanese colleagues have been teaching us for many years now about the utility of IVIS. And here was a paper from Australia, which was a randomized trial of IVIS plus angiography versus angiography alone. And it turns out there was a better primary patency in the group that used combined imaging modality. But here's the thing that was really remarkable to me. 80% of the time, their treatment strategy was affected by the use of the IVIS. And on average, the vessel diameter was about a half millimeter larger than was felt to be the case with angiography. So let's jump into another case. This was a patient with a complete occlusion of the common femoral artery, which reconstitutes distally, uh, with really no obvious nubbin and just ends in these two large collaterals. So in this particular case, we did ultrasound guided SFA retrograde access, and we were able to get through this and then we um, snared and exteriorized the wire, placed an embolic protection distally, made a pilot channel with orbital, followed by IVL with really, I think, a pretty spectacular result there. Uh, important to remember, we now have the new L6 devices. These are three centimeter long, and they, so the eight and the nines will go through a seven French sheath, the 10 and the 12s will go through an eight French sheath. So let me just show you a case that I recently did a patient with hepatitis C and B and I forgot to put in there also HIV. Uh, I actually had sent this patient to my local vascular surgery colleague who said, no, nah, okay, I think you can take care of this one, Peter. And uh, he was pretty symptomatic with the TBI is zero. You can see he's got this dense calcified CTO. Um, we were able to cross that and again made a pilot channel. But interestingly enough, after we did the orbital atherectomy, we lost the profunda. There was no flow in the profunda. And so I said, well, let's just go ahead and fix the common femoral. So we used an eight millimeter IVL, um, got a pretty nice result. But I gotta be honest with you, it was really bugging me about that profunda. So I tried to go back, see if I could try to get back in, and that didn't work. So I did ultrasound guided access of the profunda with an 018 quick cross and a wire, and I was able to get through retrograde, snared, exteriorized that wire, and then we were able to redirect, pre dilate with a four balloon, through the IVIS down there, it turns out that it was a seven millimeter profunda. And I still had 150 pulses on my, on my previous balloon, so I said, all right, well, you're not gonna drink a half a beer, you're gonna drink your whole beer, right? So I used the other 150 pulses for the profunda, followed by a DCB, got a great result. 
And then I was looking at that common femoral, and I said, eh, let me take another look at that with IBIS. It turns out it was nearly a 9-millimeter device, so we went ahead and treated it with a 9-millimeter L6 device, what I like to call the bunker buster, and then we were able to get a really terrific result. And this patient, same day discharge, doing great. So in conclusion, although endarterectomy is a durable uh, procedure, it does carry some morbidity. Uh, I think you, these case examples, I think, have shown conclusively that IVL for CFA is a very safe uh, uh, and also very effective treatment while leaving nothing behind. And in our paper, we found that when IVL, when used either with DCB, DCB or atherectomy, really resulted in a very nice uh, midterm outcomes. And these ongoing studies, I think, will help us further decide what the best treatment for common femoral disease is. But certainly, if the decision is for endo, we now have some good tools to help us with this. Thanks. If you had a bad dissection in a common femoral and you virtual occlusion, what stent would you use if you had to bail out? Yeah, I think uh, now that we have the seven and a half millimeter um, superior device, I think the superior really should be the uh, number one choice for a self-expanding stent in the common femoral, principally because it has great fracture resistance and the fact that you can stick a sheath through it later and you won't mangle or, uh, uh, because the superior, of course, is six pairs of nitinol wire as opposed to a typical laser cut nitinol stent, which potentially could get damaged if you try to put a sheath, if you try to access it later on, put a sheath through it. So we've probably done this, and I imagine a lot of my, my uh, fellow panelists on the, uh, have, have had lots of experience putting sheaths through previously de de uh, deployed superior stents. And I personally, thankfully, never had an issue in terms of being able to reaccess or had any um, damage to the common femoral artery. And would you try to limit it to the common femoral, or would you extend intentionally into the SFA with the uh, supera? I think I would probably try to limit it to the common femoral, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I, I don't like to jail the profunda if I can get away with it, if I don't have to. I would reemphasize his first slide is actually not something to forget. I know surgeons, I see a few surgeons in the room, you know, they say, well, a common femoral is easy to get to. It's right under the skin. You make a simple incision, clean out all this junk instead of trying to go through all this endo manipulations. But a, a groin incision does have significant morbidity. I know I see Peter here. We've all had lymph leaks. Lymph leaks and infected grafts in the groin are a big problem, especially in the obese, diabetic, redo groin. These are people that are going to get a groin infection almost for sure. So you can push back on your vascular surgery colleagues when they say, oh, well, this is just a simple common femoral endarterectomy. There's no such thing as a simple common femoral endarterectomy. They, always, they do carry morbidity. So I think, while I think we all want to be judicious about, you know, endo where it's not necessary, on the other hand, I think, you know, demonstrated good results, the facts are what the facts are. So, you know, I think cooperative approach is the best option. But. Peter, let me ask you a question uh, from our side. If you have TLR, like I had a great case where you shockwave DCB amazing and came back. I didn't, I didn't expect it. Do you switch your, do you go to atherectomy next? You, obviously, I was guided here. It, why did it reoccur? You know, are you just not going big enough or exactly what it, I think I wound up using like an eight millimeter uh, balloon at the end of the day. So it definitely went big, but when it comes back, do you, do you say, okay, now we got to switch gears, switch to a different approach or what do you do? Yeah, I, I think if, if, if I did say just a simple, if I did a simple IVL and it came back again, um, I might consider, well, I would, I was at first try to figure out, you know, what my mode of failure was and then on that basis try to figure out a different strategy. Uh, in that scenario, I probably would maybe try to debulk it with IVL, uh, with the uh, atherectomy, and then in all likelihood take a bigger IVL balloon, use more pulses, and then finish up with a drug-coated balloon. Now, is there any data to support any of that? That's a pretty expensive scenario that I just laid out. No, but if they've already reached the once, I'm gonna give them my best effort at a second endo procedure. And then if that fails, it's time to send them for an endorectomy. Yeah, my name is Hassan, one of the trainees. Thank you for a great talk. 
Um, so we had a great talk yesterday also about value-based care and cost-based analysis of many of the interventions that we're doing for the patients. Um, uh, and it seems that every intervention that we've seen for the common femoral included an orbital atherectomy and a DCB plus minus a supera stent and IVL. Um, have we compared the cost of um, that intervention compared to a femoral endarterectomy with a patch? And based on that cost, do you think, and the outcomes and the complications in the groin, should we be considering endovascular for all common femoral arteries or just for the patients that Dr. Edith talked about who are obese or have, um, you know, higher risk of complications? Yeah, you know, one of the, th one of the interesting things that uh, came from our analysis of our own data for that paper that we published last year in CRM was that, you know, we were early in our experience with IVL. And so we had previously always done debulking, and then when DCB came around, we did atherectomy plus DCB, and we were getting pretty good results. But initially, when we first started our foray into the world of IVL, we didn't know how it was going to work, and we were probably a bit conservative. And again, we didn't have those larger balloon sizes. But one of the things that we, one of the uh, lessons that we learned from, from IVIS was that almost all of the luminal gain, the overwhelming majority of it, was from the IVL. So after a while, we were like, gee, we could probably shorten the procedure time and decrease the cost by eliminating the atherectomy and just going directly to IVL. And then it's kind of hard not to be um, uh, compelled by the data with DCB. So we just felt that it was, nat it was just a natural synergy to do IVL followed by DCB. And quite frankly, that really is our default strategy now for common femoral. And I think that's a reasonably cost-effective strategy, particularly when you consider the low TLR rate and the fact that these are outpatient same-day procedures and you're avoiding an incision in the groin and all of the attendant, uh, attendant you know, potential complications uh, that our moderator uh, delineated a few, uh, a few minutes ago. So, I mean, these randomized trials will be very effective. I'd love to see a randomized trial of IVL DCB versus common femoral endarterectomy because in my mind, that's probably what a lot of us are doing right now and may be a little bit more clinically relevant than necessarily supera versus endarterectomy. Great discussion. Let's go on to the next uh, talk. Uh, Dr. Yunus is gonna tell us about heavily calcified SFA. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually... Uh in place of Dr. Yunus today. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, as you know, I like to keep my cases more interactive, so you guys are going to answer some of my questions today. Um, so the reason for evaluation, 55-year-old guy uh, with non-healing wound on bilateral lower extremities. Um, he has underlying hypertension, dyslipidemia, and stage renal disease on uh, dialysis. Um, and he actually underwent a uh, not-so-easy not so, uh, endarterectomy with one of my vascular surgery colleagues, and you can see exactly why it might not be easy. Uh, subsequently, he was referred to me uh, as a hi combined hybrid uh, approach for the remainder of the SFA popliteal intervention. Um, and here you can see his preceding ABI-TBI. Uh, as I usually like to say, this is flat plains like the plains of Ohio, uh, especially in the toes. <laughs> Uh, and here you can see, um, you can get a hint of the amount of calcium that's within the SFA. So, so the exact same calcium existed in that common femoral artery. Um, very heroic cases by Dr. Sukas. Um, perhaps this would have been a, a nice case to do a combined approach here, though. Um, and you can see here the entire SFA popliteal artery is occluded, uh, and there may be a hint of reconstitution in the posterior tibial artery here. So here's what I would like to implore my panelists and moderators to help me out with. How would you cross this, um, besides uh, doing a bypass, uh, how would you cross this and what would be your treatment mo modality here? This is the amount of calcium we're dealing with in the SFA pop. Just go straight to amputation. <clears throat> Getting across is no easy feat, honestly, but um, this has IVL written all over it, if you can get across this safely. Um, that's a lot of calcium, and getting luminal might be challenging, um, but obviously care in this case is to re-enter in the appropriate spot, but uh, plaque modification is going to be very important if you're going to have an endovascular strategy, because you have to expand stunts here. Yeah, I agree, June. Getting across is going to be a 
real pain. It's going to be stiff angle glide wire with a, some sort of crossing catheter, and you're going to go subintimal, and you may have to come up from below. I would, I, I, knowing you, you probably stuck a PT and, and rendezvous somewhere in the middle. Um, and IBL, obviously, with Separa, here we come, with DCB prior to Separa. Yeah, I think I agree with the comments. I mean, you're going to try to go subintimal, but uh, try to go luminal, but most likely, you know, the easiest path is going to be to cross subintimally or re-enter, and then depending on where you uh, start and, and finish, probably IVL and, and you know, I, I, I imagine D, DES probably at the end. I agree. Uh, so I think it's unrealistic for us to expect to stay true lumen in, in the face of this amount of calcium. Uh, so I kind of knew up front that we were likely going to travel subintimal. Um, so indeed, uh, as predicted, I went retrograde and antegrade. Uh, I was able to rendezvous in the mid-SFA. Uh, and I started with a little bit of balloon angioplasty here. And you can see on the third panel, the balloon really hugs the walls of the calcium. Um, so I would propose this question then. So I've traveled subintimal in the mid-SFA uh, into the POP. Uh, is, are there any atherectomy options at this point? Uh, obviously off-label. Uh, and then there, uh, keeping in mind that there's also eccentric calcium in, uh, in addition to the subintimal crossing. Our answer is no <laughs> for atherectomy. I, I've done directional atherectomy in this space. It's you got to know where you are in 3D space at all times. I, o, OA is off because uh, you're subintimal, so that's not going to make a damn bit of difference. Uh, but now with IBL, it's it's a straight up IBL. It's so much faster, so much easier. Uh, but prior to IBL, I, I used to do directional atherectomy. Others. And, and you may have to dilate this before IBL because you know it's when you ch change in these locations the guide wire. Uh, you need a lot of support also. So sometimes, you know, I've seen, I learned this from the Germans watching them. They use high, large balloons and blast this area first if they don't have IVL yet, I guess. But uh, a good quality balloon angioplasty is very, very necessary and uh, not to be fooled by just the atherectomy, just my humble choice. It's a simple tool, but still, if properly used, can be extremely, extremely effective. So, Bosch, would you use any specialty balloons? I like, I like going chocolate here because you can go up to 30 atmospheres and, and you know you're, you're not going to rupture the balloon. Excellent. All great points. Uh, I did put this one slide in here um, from one of my old talks uh, just to highlight the different, different types of atherectomy for the trainees in the room. Um, certainly, uh, we talked a little bit about directional atherectomy. Um, again, very off-label. If you use it in a subintimal space, um, know which subintimal space you're in and cut away from the, uh, from the adventitia. Uh, CSI, obviously, we are, um, we are subintimal, so not recommended uh, to do orbital atherectomy. I, I would also uh, argue that rotational and photoablative are probably not uh, options in this specific case. Um, in very heavily calcified vessels um, that you do cross luminally, I would typically um, use orbital, uh, like Peter has highlighted with his nice uh, common femoral artery cases, uh, plus minus IBL. Uh, I've found that laser sometimes can be useful to at least soften the plaque a little bit, not necessarily debulk it as much as other um, modalities may. Um, so those are considerations when you're dealing with heavily calcified uh, SFA lesions. Um, so going back to this slide, um, I wanted to show that um, you know in IBL, uh, one potential problem uh, is that when you have really eccentric calcium and that concentric calcium, some of your, um, some of your uh, ultrasound uh, beats are actually going against the other part of the vessel that is normal. So you may not necessarily be able to crack the calcium as nicely as you may uh, want. Uh, you, you, know, you can adjust the balloon a little bit uh, to see if different emitters will hit it uh, correctly. Um, I know uh, Dr. Pachukas has also talked about previously uh, using like a buddy balloon um, to uh, essentially, you want to hit the, um, the emitters against the calcium, so you would put a normal non-shockwave balloon parallel to it on the other side uh, so that you could transmit more of your uh, sound waves towards the calcified, uh, eccentric calcified lesion. Um, so uh, 
regardless, uh, after my first balloon angioplasty, I actually took a picture, and I was uh, surprised by the amount of lumen that I had gained with the first balloon angioplasty. Um, so using a more segmentalized approach, um, I chose to skip IVL in this specific case. Um, I ended up doing a drug eluding stent in the very mid to distal SFA where I had rendezvoused and created all that sub intimal space. And I did a drug eluding stent on the, on the proximal uh, SFA as well. Uh, and here's his final runoff with an uh, intact uh, pedo arch uh, and three vessel flow uh, into the foot. Uh, and he did actually did great. Uh, he uh, underwent left sided uh, intervention as well. Uh, underwent a TMA on the left side uh, and completely healed his wounds. Um, he came back to see me actually a couple weeks ago. Uh, Diehard Ohio State fan, so we always uh, give each other a lot of crap. <laughs> but uh, from from this specific case, many options uh, for modification of calcium out there. Um, but sometimes a simple balloon plus minus stent is can be adequate. Um, segmentalized approach to SFA popliteal disease is important. Um, use drug eluding stent and DCBs where most appropriate. Thank you. Did you either set stent after we excluded, you know, so to ensure stent expansion? I mean, I, my experience with those, you know, you IVIS this and it looks like a, like a half moon on the inside, you know, so I don't know if you've done that or not. Yeah, so I, I did not, I was in this specific case, I do know what you're alluding to, which is the eccentricness of the calcium. And unfortunately, you know, I, I've talked about this before, there's not a lot of data that we know of how to predict when a stent will fail in the future. Um, and sometimes I use actually hemodynamic um, data. So sometimes I put a small catheter back into the popliteal to see what my residual gradient is. Um, and that sometimes can correlate a little bit with your ABI, TBI. But, uh, you know, at this point in 2023, I think we need better evaluation of um, longevity of our work. Yep. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for your excellent talk. In the interest of time, we'll move on to the next uh, uh, presentation by Dr. Shamas. I borrowed this from you again. All right. Well, this will be a nice follow-up on the presentation that you just had. So when and why I use atherectomy? These are my disclosures. Okay, so let's put atherectomy a little bit, you know, in perspective here. You know, if you use scientific journal that the, you know, like the Wall Street Journal, I think you probably will quit using atherectomy. So having said that, let's talk a little bit about really what's true with atherectomy. So three elements to alter, you know, infrainguinal uh, peripheral arterial interventions. Uh, the optimal treatment, in my mind, is based on three elements, appropriate, appropriate vessel prepping, reducing restenosis, and protecting the outflow vessels. So if you look at appropriate vessel prepping, and we have a lot of tools nowadays, including atherectomy, to do so, the purpose is to maximize luminal area gain while limiting dissections and reducing bailout stenting and maybe improving drug dilution like we have seen, uh, and possibly can lead to a better outcome. We don't have a whole lot of data on this. Reducing restenosis, of course, antiproliferative therapy, and if you haven't heard, the FDA has given up on the idea that it hurts people, so that's a good thing. And limiting adventitial injury, you know, this would be important. As you damage the adventitia, chances are very high that restenosis will start to happen. We know this from the Mount Sinai data. Protect the outflow vessels. You could do this by using a device that has a built-in aspiration system or by the use of embolic filter protection. So let's talk about atherectomy. We have nine atherectomy devices approved in the U.S. And directional, the Hawk and the Pantheris, the rotational atherectomy, the rotablator, the Jetstream, the Phoenix, and Rotarex. Laser atherectomy using the Eximer and the Orion. And the orbital atherectomy uh, is... Uh, of course, uh, a kind of different mode of action. So atherectomy devices are not created equal, and you really need to know the differences between them. So we have two ways of looking at atherectomy. First, we have the ability to do soft debulking, which I'm a big proponent of, essentially reducing the lesion severity by about 30 to 40 percent. So if your lesion is 90 percent, it goes to 60 percent. And by the way, this is very well proven in orbital atherectomy, 
with the Arian laser and with the blade down mode of the jet stream, as well as the rotor X. When you look at the data of all these atherectomy devices, you're not taking out more than 30% of the lesion. When the pros of that is you probably get less embolization, less likely perforation, less likely damage to the deeper layer of the vessel, hopefully preserving the long-term outcome of those patients. You get maybe less gain in MLA, but you balance that by adjunctive balloon treatment. And you can use it essentially in all lesions with no exceptions. You can go to the aggressive debulking that we initially all started with aggressive debulking. You know, whether you use the Hawk or the blade up mode of a jet stream device. And that is reducing your lesion severity down to the 30% to 40%. So in other words, you know, a lesion of 90% can be down to 30%, not 60%. You get a lot of gain in the MLA, but you get more embolization, and therefore you have probably to use filters, and you will have likely more perforation and more damage to the deeper layer. We validated this by multiple IVIS studies where aggressive debulking clearly affect the deeper layer of a vessel and damage the uh, adventitial layers. But I like this in certain cases, like ISR, you know, and in bulky lesions, long lesions like chronic total occlusions, maybe sometimes in heavily calcified vessels. This is a very busy smiley faces, but that gives you a very nice summary to all what you need to know about the atherectomy devices. So look at the directional. The TurboHawk is excellent for short and eccentric lesion. Please do not use it in the case of thrombus. It's contraindicated in instant restenosis, at least in the label. Initially, we've used it for that purpose, uh, but still, you know, I would say let's stick with the label here. Uh, it works very well on CTOs as well as, uh, you know, severe calcium. The Pantheris device, because you have the OCT guidance, it's not contraindicated in instant restenosis. In fact, it's indicated in that case you could use it, uh, but still not for thrombus. It works very well on eccentric lesions. The rotational devices, if you look at the jet stream, is very good for calcium, for CTOs, and for instant restenosis. However, this is still off-label for instant restenosis in the U.S., even though the data looks really very nice. And when you look at the Rotarax, I would not use a Rotarax in the setting of severe calcium, particularly eccentric lesion. You're asking for trouble. Perforations will happen, and it did happen in my own hands and it's not really nice to see your vessel perforated. So I would avoid that. The look at the laser, you can see a lot of greens. You know, the difference between the Eximer and the Orion uh, is really very subtle. We have a little bit more data with the Eximer for ISR as well as below the knee. We're piling up more data on the Orion below the knee right now. We just finished a multi-center trial, and the data hopefully will appear very soon. Uh, for a thrombus, it works just fine, you know, and uh, the orbital atherectomy, of course, works great for severe calcium, especially below the knee, it works excellent, but it's not for thrombotic lesion or instant restenotic lesion. So I don't think you have all those devices in your lab. I get six out of the nine in my own lab. Most labs have one or two devices, you know, so which one do you choose? You know, if I look at this, I think, you know, the laser and the orbital are good devices to have if you have no other choices. So again, for lesion-specific devices, for ISR, the laser works good. We have good data there. The jet stream and the Rotarax, make sure you have DCB added to those. That's how you're going to optimize your results. For eccentric lesions, directional atherectomy is good. Severe calcium, as I said, orbital atherectomy, jet stream, Arian, we're talking about atherectomy, not IVL right now, but IVL is a great option. Below the knee, Again, laser and orbital atherectomy. CTO, maybe you want to be a little bit more aggressive in debulking. Make sure you have filters. And for thrombotic lesions, the jet stream, the rotor X, and the Arian laser, and the Eximer tend to be very good uh, devices to choose. Thank you very much. All I can say is it's pretty darn confusing in reality. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm one of these people that hadn't done a lot of this stuff, my brain is spinning with devices, and it is very challenging to put an objective algorithm together and say, this is what you should or shouldn't do. Obviously, what you have is a lot of really skilled people who've had a lot of personal experience, and they just like fishermen, some guys figure out they like a seven-foot pole with an eight-pound test with a one-quarter-ounce jig, and somebody else can't catch anything with that. You kind of have to figure out you know, how you're going to catch fish. And I think it's a pretty darn challenging uh, uh, 
challenging for, for all of us to really figure out what the best technique is. Uh, well, let's keep going and find out. Uh, Dr. Hamid, is that where we are? Tarek Hamad. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Tarek, new year, new style. Okay, thank you. So I'll be talking today about a uh, segmentalized approach to femur popliteal disease, mainly about the uh, use of DCB and stents. Okay, so I have a few cases. I'm going to try to be uh, quick. Um, so first case, I was an 87-year-old uh, lady who uh, underwent an amputation of her uh, right hallux for a wound and osteomyelitis. And the podiatrist was very concerned during ORS that there was barely any bleeding, so she underwent a revask attempt uh, second day was failed with uh, residual extensive dissection. Uh, you know, uh, comorbidities is pertinent. Uh, she had same uh, extremity, old bypass, uh, fem pop, and she had a prior attempt a uh, year ago for SFAPTA. This is again uh, post the op. You know, the right great uh, toe. This is the uh, AVR. You can see the way from damp from the popliteal and down flat at the digit level. Um, you know, this is the first. In the left panel, this is a you know, picture of the SFA from prior attempt. You can see residual extensive dissection. And uh, pop looks OK. Uh, two vessel runoff, foot, not much blood going there. So you know, up front, I decided to go retrograde, just knowing there's extensive dissection. I went up the mid-thigh. You know, uh, I, I went subintimal. That when I keep going up and extend that to the CFA, so I decided to take the subintimal space uh, they had from the uh, Prox SFA. Rendezvous, externalized, did PTA, DCB, and this is the uh, image uh, afterwards. So what's next? As you see, in extensive dissection in the ocular proxima SFA, there's also a little perf, which we did balloon tamponade. So how would you address this proxima SFA disease? Um, you know, no-brainer DES. <clears throat> I think with extensive dissection, flow limiting, go from healthy to healthy. Usually I try not to be acute, so I extend to the CFA. I don't want to miss it. Uh, there's still some SFA dissection, but, you know, uh, non-flow limiting. Uh, pop looks good to vessel runoff, and this is a final image. She was discharged last week and to follow up in uh, <clears throat> next uh, four weeks. Okay, so drug looting extent, we have a lot of data for, uh, you know, uh, from the Zilver uh, PTX randomized trial. We have five year results showing superiority of the DS versus standard of care, which is PTA, at five years. There's another uh, recent trial for DS versus BMS. <clears throat> DS is superior. 85% uh, compared to 76% prime pertinency at uh, one year. Okay, second case, uh, athletic 55-year-old had outside hospital stent, you know, uh, remotely, honestly, any clear reason why. Uh, but, you know, he has been having severe claudication, uh, quality of life limiting, again, he's young, athletic, uh, and failed exercise rehab, and most recently has this, you know, kissing uh, toes ulcer, and his uh, waveform are very flattened. Uh, this is angiogram, uh, you see the SFA is cut off, um, and reconstitute at the pop level. I don't know if you can appreciate the second panel. Here's a stent. That is all the stent. He has a nice runoff. And, uh, you know, uh, this is after balloon angioplasty. So, as you see, you know, you see there's some haziness in the distal SFA proxy, the oldest stent. The pop also does not look PT8 again for a prolonged time and still looks the same. What would you do next? Supera across the knee is a high flexion point, a lot of uh, high risk for fractures. He's athletic, young. So supera across the knee and uh, self-expanding stent, a proximal overlap with the uh, proximal of the oldest stent. And this is from pre to post. <clears throat> okay, so waveform approved, uh, healing ulcer, no more symptoms. Again, supera, all the studies and the trials have been done, zero fracture at one year. So, you know, six interwoven wires, very uh, fracture resistant. And uh, good patency at two years is uh, about 84%. Case number three, quickly, you know, again, 68-year-old lady, multiple intervention, remote SFA stand, now with non-healing wound in the right side, damp waveform, TBI of 0.34, this ocel SFA occlusion, reconstitute distal SFA, balloon, DCB. It's not playing. Okay, here we go. What we do next? I guess nothing. This would be work. Okay, so this shard follow up in four weeks. 
uh, record balloon all have level one of evidence. You know, we all know that they, you know, uh, maintain the anti property of the stand while, you know, eliminating the need to leave a scaffold behind. And recently, as, as we mentioned, that the FDA warning has been taken off. Limitation as any other balloon angioplasty dissection recoil. Uh, case four, quickly, 53-year-old, also left lower extremity CLI, gangrene, uh, TBI of 0.14 only. Uh, uh, short, as Dr. Uh, Shamas mentioned, short eccentric. I decided to do a terectomy hawk here and balloon and looks beautiful. His, this is, you know, I didn't have initial picture, but this is after uh, the uh, first reamputation for his gangrene, and this is on follow-up and his waveform improved. I also have done, uh, he had severe TPT and PT, which I have worked on as well. A terectomy against many analysis, and now there's this momentum to use a combination of DCB plus minus debulking, you know, uh, to improve patency, minimize stent use, but there's unfortunately no randomized data to support that. Uh, last case, 81-year-old, uh, left lower extremity CLI, flat toe waveform. Uh, this patient, as you see, this is, you know, his SFA, he has hardware, so it's like a frog position, horrifying calcium, so no-brainer, I guess, from prior presentation, shock wave. It still has a residual 50%, but honestly, I decided I did not want to put any stent. His gangrene was, you know, tiny size, right to grade toe, and I decided this would be sufficient. And the flow was seemed non-limiting. His waveform actually was very surprising. This is second day he was inpatient. Unfortunately, this patient actually died three months later from a heart attack, so I'd never seen him um, follow up. Okay, so shockwave, we have one year randomized data from this drop trial. You know, uh, patency uh, compared to, uh, you know, uh, PTA and DCB uh, versus, you know, DCB and IVL. So higher primary patency, which is defined as, you know, as a freedom from bail outstanding as an index procedure, uh, absence of restenosis and follow-up ultrasound, and, uh, you know, no uh, TLR. And still uh, much higher at uh, two years, 75% versus 57%. Okay, so key learning points that uh, we have uh, too many tools, but we don't have a lot of consensus in some of the tools. Uh, so we need to individualize and actually maybe maybe even segmentalize the approach uh, to femoral popliteal disease, depending on the how we cross intimal, subintimal, uh, patient characteristic, plaque morphology, heavily calcified, location lesion, prox SFA, osseal SFA versus maybe popliteal versus uh, mid SFA. And sometimes you may have to use a different device, same patient to come up with the best results. And this algorithm we published in the uh, Vasa Medicine Journal, how we approach, you know, if, depending if the bulking is necessary or not, and then a PTA, you reassess for recall and dissection. No DCB reassess, no done. If you have dissections, then depending on your location, it determines the uh, destination therapy. Elovia, Prox, and Mid SFA, or DCB plus Supera for distal SFA poverty. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Um, you know, I want to just acknowledge Dr. Osama Aida who is in the audience from Japan, he, does, he did pivotal work in describing the eccentricity and deployments and optimization of stents using intravascular ultrasound. We replicated and just published our data from XLPAD, replicating his, his work and to validate those findings. Second, we have just, I think my core lab team is here, we have just, working on a manuscript presented at, the, at last uh, ACC as an abstract, I think Dr. Aida saw that, is stent migration. So there is, I, I will not give out the number, but osteal SFA self-expanding stents tend to migrate proximally. Uh, it can be a problem. I just want to uh, address that. I think I showed uh, uh, Dr. Metzger at one of the Viva conferences, one of the images, but I think uh, it will soon sh show up in publication. So uh, those are important points to remember. So with that, let's move on to the concept of leave nothing behind. Is there a lot of hype or there is hope or how is our practices different from the segmentalized approach? And, and uh, uh, to enlighten us is Michael Jolly. Michael, you have the uh, clicker on you? I'm sorry? You have the clicker? I do. Perfect. I have the clicker. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, Michael Jolly from Columbus, Ohio. Um, my disclosure is primarily I'm from Austin, so well, I, I'm glad to get to come back and see my family. But my only take home from this talk is that uh, my daughter there is holding Round Rock Donuts. If you, if you ever had Round Rock Donuts, they're awesome. They're a little bit north of here, about 15 miles. Texas barbecue, Friday night lights, and of course, Texas Longhorns. Um, the idea of leaving nothing behind, I think, is represented. I, this isn't my slide, and I don't know who I stole this from, so if it's someone in this room, thank you for creating this beautiful graphic. But this is 
uh, I think encompasses uniquely what is different in, in the fem pop segment than almost any other vessel in the body. And there's a lot of vessels in the body that have a lot of these forces, but this is uniquely susceptible to atherosclerotic disease, and it poses the problems that we have to deal with when it comes to revascularizing extension, torsion, the compression, the flexion. Um, I think a little bit before I joined this field, you know, this was the interventionalist toolbox. I mean, it was a balloon, a bare metal stent. We did have atherectomy, we had kind of adapted, but the problem now, um, as was alluded to earlier, is this is our toolbox now, and it's really, really confusing to really know which of these tools we're gonna bring for the, the specific lesion that we're asked to, to tackle. So the algorithms that were just shown, um, all the different strategies with IVL and atherectomy and plaque modification and which type of stent, this is really, I think, where we have evolved to in this field. Um, this is mostly a survey talk. Uh, we're, we're really talking about should we leave nothing behind or not. There are definite pros to leaving nothing behind, and there's nothing more annoying, I think, if any of us would say, than going back and, and, and readdressing a lesion that you've already treated once. And, and this is, you know, it's easier to go back when you don't have to navigate through stents, as evidenced by this, this slide here, where you're getting around the beginning of a stent, or um, leaving nothing behind um, um, takes the ideal of interventionalist creep where we end up stenting, where a surgeon might lay a bypass graft. Um, it leaves more options on the table, and frankly, it's less complicated when you're following these patients. So if you have a patient with restenosis of a de novo vessel versus restenosis of a stent graft, obviously your strategy uh, are, is, is quite a bit different. On the, on the flip side, there are definitely cons to leaving nothing behind, as it were. And I think the most important con is just having an ineffective clinical result. It, it may look good angiographically, but it actually may not be, um, you may not have achieved what the ultimate goal is, which is to maintain a, a, a vessel such that blood vessel flow and pressure can be transmitted to the distal bed. That's really what the SFA and POP do. And if you can't leave them with that fundamental function of that vessel behind, then you've probably not really provided the result that you, you sought out to achieve. There's also this concept of overutilization of vessel prep in, in extended procedure times, which I think we probably don't spend a lot of attention um, talking about. Um, the two main factors that really affect vessel patency that's really shooken out over the last 20 years of clinical trials is lesion length and calcification. And all the rest are listed here, but lesion length and calcification are the hurdles we have to overcome primarily. If you go back to the mid-2000s, and, and angioplasty was primarily the modality of treatment, if you look at the kind of moderate length lesions, these are kind of your run-of-the-mill SFA lesions, balloon angioplasty was is, is horrible, it's, ter it's horrific. You know, your, your combined 12-month patency of 33%, um, this has been bested by almost every modality you can throw at it at this point. So PTA alone, it was a good starting point, but it's really been surpassed by everything else. Interestingly, even in the DCB trials where the PTA arm was the control group, we've actually gotten better at just general balloon angioplasty alone. Um, whether it's our technique, our, our better, better balloons, duration of inflation, we have definitely upped that game. But nevertheless, uh, drug-coated balloons have become the workforce, I think, in SFA um, disease uh, primarily. And this has been represented in almost every clinical trial that's been done. It's bested PTA, and the results tend to be durable. Um, out to three years even, when you look at uh, impact, et cetera, it maintains its, uh, it, it maintains its uh, ability uh, for um, keeping the vessel open, for besting PTA as a primary uh, control arm. So PTA, although it has gotten better, in fact, if you look at Ranger, um, you know, the PTA results uh, were pretty good by themselves. But nevertheless, uh, DCB rules. And, and breaking news as of this year, as we all know, as of this month, as we all know, is that we are no longer apparently killing patients with paclitaxel. The FDA has finally removed all restrictions after kind of looking at all the data over the past several years. They've kind of concluded there's not enough evidence to suggest paclitaxel has a mortality signal. Um, last time uh, we spoke on this several years ago, you know, this was top, top center in everyone's mind, but this has kind of shook itself out. The problem with the DCB trials, as any clinical trials, the trials don't always represent what we see in our labs and our ORs. Most of the lesion links tended to be short. Uh, the results were great, they're spectacular, but they're not really what we see in daily practice. Lucky for us, there's a lot of data on longer lesions. And if you look at over the years, the longer the lesions, uh, we, we do take a hit with, um, with patency. Uh, although the patency remains high. 
But it is interesting, as you get into the CTOs, as you get into the really long lesions, these trials really had a lot of bailed out stenting. There weren't really DCB versus PTA trials. These were really DCB with stenting versus PTA. And I, and I think this has been reflected on every single trial. The longer the lesion, the more complex the lesion, CTO, calcification, the more likely you're gonna have bailout stenting, sometimes as high as you know, nearly 50%. You know, if you look back at Medicare data, you look back at other trials, um, nearly half of patients treated for SFA disease needed a scaffold of some, of some kind. So there's that. Again, short lesions, low rates of scaffold, bailout skinning, long lesions, high rates of scaffolding. Um, what about atherectomy? We've kind of talked about atherectomy. What's its role in this leave nothing behind paradigm? Um, well, it actually serves a role. Uh, I'm using directional atherectomy as kind of representative of all atherectomy, and they're definitely not created equal. But um, atherectomy can certainly reduce the need for stenting, and this has really been shown. Uh, great results with, digital, with, with directional atherectomy with DCB, as you can see, used in combination. Bellet stenting was basically zero in this particular trial. But really, if you look at all the atherectomy trials, and this is not obviously meant to be read, there is less stenting in atherectomy. So less stenting in atherectomy in general. What about drug-coated uh, balloons versus drug-eluting stents, the, the use of a scaffold, so therefore leave something behind strategy. When you compare them in complicated lesions, long lesions, CTOs, lots of calcification, they really looked about the same at 12 months, but if you look out further, there seems to be a signal that the use of a scaffold may have some patency advantage uh, over time. Um, looking at our two most used DESs, so your, uh, your Evolute, Alluvia, rather, and Zilvers, both with excellent patency. This is out to five years now. Five years, uh, primary patency, great five-year TLR, freedom from TLR results. Scaffolding is not necessarily your enemy, I think is the take home here. Um, and then if you look at these kind of vascular mimetic type stents like Supera or, or Biomedics, whatever, um, these, these stents by themselves, you know, in absence of DCB, have properties that are specifically tailored to this unique vascular bed. Um, and, and when deployed appropriately, carry um, excellent patency as well. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention um, tax because tax perfectly straddles this leave nothing behind or leave maybe a small metal implant behind uh, versus stenting the whole vessel. And, and the data on tax is great too. I mean, we, we have both above the knee and below the knee data uh, with excellent um, safety data, with good patency data, um, kind of using to optimize PTA results. So um, if our toolbox continues to grow, but kind of putting it all together, I think we can look back over the many years of trials and recognize if you're just doing balloon angioplasty, you, you probably should consider changing your strategy. No one's really doing that anymore. I think drug-coated balloons remain the, the lion's share workhorse of SFA disease. However, as you get longer and more complicated, it's very likely, the data would suggest at least, that a scaffold should be used um, for long-term patency and durability. Um, atherectomy is great, especially in, in areas you don't want to stent, common femorals, maybe popliteals, adductor canal areas, um, and then tax and, and other applications. So I think really the relevant question isn't so much is leave nothing behind the strategy we should be all going for. Uh, the strategy we should all be going for really is a meaningful clinical endpoints of patency and, and, and setting out to achieve what you, what you sought to achieve, whether it's wound healing or clotic, freedom from claudication. Um, so in some regards, it's hype, but I think uh, the toolbox continues to expand. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Certainly is a wealth of information, and for some of us, including myself, it's actually overwhelming. But uh, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll move on uh, to the next topic, uh, surgical approach to common femoral uh, and the uh, infrapopliteal uh, disease. Dr. Bianchi. so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here to talk about surgical approach to femoropathial disease. And um, my disclosures, uh, nothing to disclose. And uh, anatomically, as we all have uh, been learning this morning, there are different segments, and they actually do behave different. Some of them are more political than others, but certainly they do behave a little bit different. Also, the indication for procedures are different, and the natural history of the patency of those are affected by the actual clinical indication, and we all should have that in mind as well. 
from the surgical options we offer really in arterectomy, which more commonly plays in the common femoral, but can also be done in the popliteal segment as well, and open bypasses with autologous conduit being the greatest saphenous vein, and everybody else really is an alternative conduit and behaves patency-wise much, much less inferior. So a couple of cases, 73-year-old male with left lower extremity critical limb ischemia with end-state renal disease, calcifilaxis, diabetes. He's a wheelchair-bound, but he does uh, transfer with a prosthesis. He's an ischemic uh, heart failure patient with 30% with no prior lower extremity interventions. So you see on exam, non-femoral pulse on the ipsilateral side, gangrenous uh, changes in the left uh, fifth toe, then an ulcer on the second the angiographic uh, angiosome is the lateral plantar with a wound three, perfusion three, infection one staging. So he has poor conduit, he has uh, occlusive disease in the common femoral, as you can see there with the origin occlusion of the um, profunda femoris and a uh, segment of the uh, femoral popliteal which is preserved and, and tibial occlusive disease. So the clinical challenge is critical limb ischemia, I think we all agree is pretty challenging by itself. The assessment of the patient risk is high as his EF is 30% at his atrial disease. The first question that we all ask is, is this STREMI salvageable? And we certainly agree that in this case it's salvageable. And anatomic is a two-segment disease, common femoral and tibial occlusive, and it has a poor quality conduit. So the next step, I think there's more than one way to skin this cat and all the things that we're talking can be applied for this particular patient as well. We selected to do a common femoral enterectomy profundoplasty under local anesthesia to decrease some of those uh, complications uh, that were mentioned on common femoral enterectomy. Uh, then we did a few days later an up and over uh, plantar intervention with PT inflow and then a third stage to amputation, and he did actually well. A little bit of supporting data, the global guidelines uh, defined a high-risk patient, somebody who will have a mortality more than 55%, sorry, and uh, two-year survival uh, less than 50%. That's what we consider a high-risk patient. And um, also, whether when you have inflow and outflow procedure in the setting of critical limb ischemia, whether you should correct both at the same time versus a stage approach, I think it really is based on the severity of the limb that you're treating. Uh, I think as long as you don't lose the patient to follow up and you have a continuous of care, you should be okay. Uh, the political part is the Society of Alaska Surgery kind of tries to make us avoid stenting in the common femoral artery, which I think most of us who do endovascular as well have done common femoral stenting in the properly uh, subset that we feel comfortable doing at the end of the day, regardless how much we experts can talk about things. At the end of the day, it's about you guys feeling your skill set necessary to not harm the patient first and provide the adequate outcome, and that grows with time. Um, so the key learning for us was inflow should be corrected. Common femoral occlusions can be done in high-risk patients under MAC. Uh, short interval to address the outflow should be the norm, not the exception. A second case, quickly, is a 72-year-old female referred to our practice for intermittent claudication after endovascular re-intervention. The priority interventions were an SFA atherectomy and stenting for a hallux wound that is healed a year ago. And six months later, she has uh, intermittent claudication disabling for which she uh, seeks attention. On exam on this third presentation after the, sec the re intervention times two, has a rest ABI of 0.8 and a conduit that actually has good quality and an occluded um, SFA stenting. In this case, um, she was approached by me actually six months ago, uh, able to cross very, very easy, a little bit of thrombotic material, develop, uh, place uh, a filter protection, uh, aspirate, and then drug coated balloon, and then actually an adequate angiographic result and clinical result as well. But six months later, she comes again with instant restenosis, presenting with intermittent claudication again. So, what's the next step? And uh, you're talking about an endo times three, or surgical bypass, in intermediate claudication. And in this case, what we chose uh, to go through is, well, intermediate claudication is the stage. She has two interventions, the last one six months ago, so early in stem stenosis again, and a uh, good quality conduit. So to us, the plan of care was elastosol and exercise therapy first, and uh, let her know that there is still options. The natural history of intermediate claudication is not uh, something that needs to be addressed immediately. 
and uh, in the future, if that fails, whether a third reintervention versus a surgical bypass. And in this case, actually, she did well with the uh, exercise therapy and silastasol, so I'm happy to report that she's walking better. Uh, in terms of guidelines to what to do when you have a prior intervention and you debut with claudication, actually, is not rated for the Society for Vascular Surgery. So I think it's dealer's choice what to do in this procedure. So I think important keys for us is the stage of the PID at recurrence. It's not the same to debut with a CLI versus intermediate claudication. Uh, the timing of the recurrence as well. And uh, no interventional treatment sometimes gives you time. Uh, to follow up the patient. So what is the role of open surgical intervention? Endarterectomy uh, for the native common femoral occlusions, I think, continues to be uh, a tool that we use. Bypass in intermediate claudications only when medical and endovascular therapy has failed repeatedly. And in CLTI, in an average risk patients, when single segment greater sarsen of vein is available, when there is significant burden of disease in the femoropopatial segment, all those predictors that we've been seeing all morning, single vessel runoffs and after failed endovascular approach is something that we need to think about. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, um, the, I'm going to make a change and make the next two speaker announcements simultaneously because it is with intent that those topics have been placed. One is, first is Dr. Peter Schneider, uh, who is going to talk about the uh, best CLI study and share results, his insights, and following which immediately, without any further announcement, will be our uh, esteemed uh, uh, moderator and uh, speaker, who, who is an, a legend in vascular surgery, Dr. Ait, uh, who will discuss. So, I, and, and then there will be, I, I think, a lot of good exchanges and comments, and following which uh, Dr. Feldman will speak about an SFA popliteal case that he should have sent for endovascular but had not decided originally. So it's a, uh, it's a series of, uh, of conversations that we're going to have. Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Schneider, you have your clicker, my friend? Okay, perfect. All on. So we'll arm. follow each other uh, in a sequence, and I think uh, our AV team is now adept at making those changes. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the best CLI kind of fits into the kind of week we've had, you know, with the, uh, all these crazy things going on. Uh, these, um, you know, sometimes years go by and nothing really moves the needle and then there's a big announcement. I, I, I put the best CLI in that category. It's important. It's something that all of us need to look at, including some of the announcements of the past week. I also think that um, one thing that's not on the program but we could probably talk about in discussion is how this fits given the Basel II results that came uh, just a few weeks after best CLI. So um, the most important thing here in terms of my disclosures is that I was a big supporter of best CLI. I enrolled a lot of patients. I was on some of the committees um, and also as a member of Viva was in a strong agreement that we should support the trial financially when it seemed like it wasn't gonna complete because they were running out of money. So. I'll just start with a couple of uh, cases here. Uh, this is a left great toe osteomyelitis. Patient's only 59 years old. He's working 50 hours a week. He's got uh, kind of a unique problem, not your typical CLTI, but he's got this elevated platelet count with a primary thrombocytosis and the JAK2 gene. And he's got a good saphenous vein. And this is his runoff. He's been steadily picking off his runoff with platelet thrombi uh, for a, probably a period of years. And, uh, you know, you could probably fix this with endo, but with a good vein and a young, healthy patient, to me, having a conduit that is lined with healthy autologous endothelium is the way to go. And you know that his platelet count at some point in his life is, again, going to be too high. And um, that was my solution for that. So here's another CLTI patient on the other end of the spectrum, 82 years old, mild dementia, frail. She's been on ambulatory for weeks uh, since the gangrene first occurred and nobody really wanted to do anything to an 80-something uh, uh, frail person with mild uh, dementia. When it came clear that she was gonna lose the leg, otherwise she got referred. And you can see it's complex for endo. There's a flush occlusion at the SFA origin. There's common femoral artery disease. She reconstitutes really distal P2. So if you fix this open, this is a below knee 
pop, uh, fem pop bypass. So to me, this was a good endo case. Even though it was more challenging for endo, the patient really didn't fit the profile of somebody that I thought was a good candidate for surgery. So um, what did we learn? Well, both therapies work. There's an acceptably low rate of major amputation in both groups. Both appear to be quite safe. I mean, all of the surgical patients didn't die from myocardial infarction. They had a higher rate of MACE than the endo group, but it, it was accept, what I would say in, in the range of acceptable. The value of teams was important, and the groups that did best in the, CL, in the best CLI trial were groups that worked as a team. Uh, where they had their best operators, both open and endo, involved in the screening and the evaluation and the treatment, et cetera. And um, the other thing, this last bullet point, I think was really driven home, both in this trial and the Basil II, and that is, this is a horribly sick population. You know, we're fix-it people, so we're focusing on what we can fix, but the truth is, this is worse than most cancers. I mean, this is like stage four fill in the blank. I mean, at, at 2.7 years, 33 to 38% were dead and 10 to 15% had lost limbs. And keep in mind, these were patients that the team felt were good candidates for surgery or acceptable candidates for surgery. The mortality rate in the basal, in the basal two was even higher. So I just wanted to talk about two things. And I, I know I want to get uh, John's comments and he'll probably have uh, some important things to say about these two things. But with all of these RCTs, these two issues always come up. The appropriateness of the endpoint and the generalizability of the results. So the appropriateness of the endpoint. Now, I think amputation-free survival is too high level for us to learn anything about whether these therapies work. The mortality rates are so high that they overshadow everything else. And so... I, although death should be included, I think if you just look at amputation-free survival, you just you would close the curtain, tell the patient whatever happens, happens. So I think for us to make progress in this field, we need a limb-based outcome. So I don't know if male is quite the right one, but we're gaining more and more information on male all the time, so major adverse limb events. And in this trial, the uh, thing that drove the endpoint was major adverse limb events. The challenge with major adverse limb events is they're comprised really realistically of two things, and that is a, a major amputation of the limb or a crossover from endo to bypass. So 23.5% of the patients crossed over from endo to bypass, and that really drove the endpoint in this case. The challenge, though, is that the technical failure rate in the endo group was around 15%. It was much lower in the surgical group. So, and I know all, all of my endovascular only friends are all in a huff, like that's way too high. We never have a 15% technical failure rate. Yeah, but keep in mind, this is a subset of the patients that had clinical equipoise, and I'm gonna go into that. So I don't think we can learn anything from that number alone, because this isn't the 100% of patients that show up at your door. This is a subset of patients where equally qualified people looked at the patient and said, well, I wouldn't do a bypass on that patient because it's so straightforward for endo. So this screened out all the straightforward for endo patients, or at least I think ideally in most sites that's what would have happened. But the other thing that is a little bit concerning is that the timing of the reintervention was determined by the trial site investigator. So whereas in most device IDE trials, if you have a CDTLR, which is sort of the equivalent of somebody crossing over, it's essentially um, an important reintervention. You typically have really set criteria for hemodynamics, for symptoms, for recurrent disease, et cetera. But that wasn't really done here. So it, it muddies the water a little bit in terms of the endpoint. So even though I think a limb-based endpoint is really important, we need more information than what we got so far. Now keep in mind, there is a 61-page supplement, and there are many corollary publications planned, including one on technical failures and other things. So we will learn more. I think that will be important. 
The other big thing is generalizability. So the enrolling team had to believe that there was equipoise from a standpoint of the anatomic disease morphology. So for example, if I'm enrolling a patient, I'm not considering doing a bypass in somebody that has something that looks like straightforward anatomy for me to do endo with good results. And so if you think about it that way, it means there was a bit of a sliding scale in every institution that enrolled because the endo capabilities or the bypass capabilities may be relatively variable. But the flip side to that, and this is part of our discussion, is that this is real world stuff. This is what's happening at those institutions on a day by day basis. The other thing is this issue of fitness for open surgery. And as I already mentioned, the, the mortality rate after bypass was acceptable, in my opinion, in BEST, it was a couple of percent, but it was much higher in uh, basal two, it was 6%. So I'll just close up here by saying that if you think about this in a stylized version and you look at fitness for open surgery on the up and down axis, high risk, low risk, if you look at disease morphology on the horizontal axis, maybe more straightforward for endo versus more challenging for endo, I mean, in my opinion, you don't typically do a bypass on somebody that's straightforward for endo, and, and you typically do endo on somebody, even if the, and disease morphology is saying bypass, you really are better off with endo if the patient is clearly not fit for surgery. You don't want to do anything to hasten their mortality. So that's what I mean about the fact that there, there had to be equipoise. So this introduces, by virtue of the inclusion-exclusion criteria, a selection bias. So we don't know, though, if the best CLI is this whole other group, the other 70%, or if the best CLI is really this group, the people who were most fit for open surgery, because the straightforward endo cases and the older, sicker patients were probably screened out. And that's why the average, the mean age was about 10 years younger in best than it was in basal two. And lastly, I'll just say that the BEST trial, just for clarity, did not include something that we do all the time, which is hybrid procedures. So here's a patient with uh, rest pain. He's 80, so it'd be nice not to operate on him with open surgery, but you can see his profunda is completely missing right next to that common femoral stenosis. And he's also got a popliteal occlusion. So for me, that's a good hybrid case where we reopen and repair the, the uh, profunda in a way that I could not do this endo. Although Peter might have, because he might have done a retrograde ultrasound guided access to the profunda, not something I would have considered at that time. Um, but, um, and then we did a stent for his popliteal. So he ends up with a hybrid procedure. And we find a lot of applications for this, and that was not part. So if somebody really needed a hybrid procedure, they probably did not get entered in best. And to me, this is another probably 10% of the patients. So I'll leave it there. And uh, I think we'll get to these conclusions in our discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. You know, as usual, I've, I've known Peter for probably, I don't know, 30 years. And uh, he's never a good guy to follow because he's got a, uh, the most logical uh, way of approaching complex problems and breaking it down into, you know, digestible and understandable pieces. And I think the points he's made here are just really, really critical about uh, best CLI. It was a challenge. If you put yourself, I don't know if any of you enrolled in this trial, but it's a pretty hard trial to sit down with somebody and do informed consent. You sit down with somebody and say, well, you've got an SFA occlusion. And on the one hand, first of all, you have to come in and say, we really don't have a clue what we're doing. We don't know the answer to your problem. And on the one hand, I can stick a needle in your groin and send you home tomorrow, or I can slice your leg open. Which do you want to do? And are you okay if we just let a computer randomize you? Well, naturally, there's a huge amount of bias that goes into that. I come into the table and I go, you got a little short SFA occlusion. Could I do a bypass? Yeah, but would I reasonably randomize you to that when I could put a short balloon in and a stent and walk away? Well, no, that patient's not going to get randomized because of my bias. Another institution, that patient may well have gotten randomized in the trial. It's, uh, it, and then how aggressive are you going to be if you're one of the endo operators? 
do you uh, do everything possible to actually now make a, a, a surgical salvage less likely? Or do you say, hey, I gave it a shot at the SFA. I didn't re-enter very easily. I've got a good surgical option and bailout with an above-knee bypass. So I kind of bias myself against the most uh, successful kind of fancy endo work that you've seen displayed this morning. So it, it, there was a lot of hidden features in this trial that make it a little tricky to fully understand. I've got a few thoughts, if I can get this thing to go forward. I don't know, maybe if I have to point it at something. I'm going to keep doing this until something happens. Any, is there a presentation that goes with this? or Can you all advance it, somebody? I don't know. Is anybody here from maybe? There we go. I have a few, this is kind of a preamble. As you get older, you get this kind of dementia thing, and you just have thoughts in the shower. So these were thoughts I had in the shower about uh, PAD. One of them is that not everybody with CLTI loses their leg without revascularization. There's some thought of, well, it's limb salvage. If I don't do something, they're going to lose their leg. And there's been a number of studies just talking about excellent wound care, that a lot of these people don't lose their legs. A lot of them do, but it's not as though everyone does. There's no such thing as resting claudication. I hope none of you ever use this term. I've heard people use it. There's no such thing. Uh, what else is there? There's no such thing as a Doppler pulse. Is everybody savvy to that? If you call me in the middle of the night and say somebody has a pulse, it meant you could feel it with some part of your hand. You could put your hand on it. Better to call it a Doppler signal. Quite often you see people treating so-called ulcers on the thigh or on the calf that are, quote, arterial with toe pressures that are in the 60 or 70 or 80 percent range, 80 millimeter range. Those are not arterial ulcers. This is some other kind of dermatologic problem, but it's not an excuse for doing uh, arterial intervention. Diabetic neuropathy. This is a, one of the more common complications I see people do. They come in and they've got leg pain, foot pain in particular, burning foot pain, and you get some tibial disease on a CTA or ultrasound with toe pressures that are 80. Next thing you know, they're getting tibial angioplasty and a bunch of atherectomy and other kind of interventions. They had neuropathy. They didn't really have arterial disease at all. And we're treating so-called breast pain because it was pain at rest, but it's not fundamentally circulatory. The SFA is cosmetic. Obviously, this is intended to be a provocative statement, but it is important to remember the profunda really does provide most of the blood supply to the thigh. And if you don't disturb the collaterals around the knee, very few people lose their leg if they have a good pulse in their profunda. So the SFA, it's obviously an important vessel, but, but really remember that profunda really matters. A um, lot of, lot of uh, the other thing to remember on best CLI, it's, it's exclusive to these people who have not got just claudication. You know, claudication is basically a benign disease. It's workload related. It's reproducible, and a very small fraction of people with claudication who treated with good medical management, meaning exercise and weight loss and stop smoking, get your hypertension under control, get your lipids under control, will lose their leg without intervention. So don't forget that. This study, this best CLI, is looking at a malignant population with advanced vascular disease and a high likelihood of limb loss. So this idea that if you've got rest pain or an ulcer on your foot, that's not a good signal from Mother Nature. Basically, your legs are rotting off. I mean, this is a, a, a disease that's an end-stage disease. And if we can change the survival, I'm not sure you can, but if, if focusing on changing survival uh, probably is a pretty important um, something to learn from the study. So here's an 83-year-old woman. She's got rest pain. She's got a good saphenous vein. This is six years ago, whatever February of 18 is. She's got kind of this tibial disease. All we did was some angioplasty with a drug-eluting balloon. She goes six years and, and did fine. She lost a big toe, but basically did fine. Came back this year, toe pressure again down in the 20s. And she's got this little chunk of stuff mostly in the middle of her popliteal. We didn't do a heck of a lot of anything. We basically did shockwave, put some balloons in, and toe pressure came up to 99. She didn't have a bypass. She's doing okay. Should, with a, with a base, if you look at best CLI, should she have had a bypass? Um, you know, I think it's pretty hard to justify bypass in this kind of a little old frail lady. Another one, 47-year-old uh, woman, smoking diabetes, rest pain, 
typical kind of tibial disease. This is in 07. She gets an SFA stent. Uh, a year later, she comes back. Let's just see. A year later, she comes back. Significant instant restenosis. Gets another angioplasty and goes amazingly 10 years after that. This is 11 of 08. They came back a month later and hit the tibials, kind of cleaned that up. 2018, 10 years after that, she's better. So anyway, the short answer on these things, I think we don't know. I think you've got good answers for, for both. Here's a patient, uh, again, we're still following along in this uh, four years later after a tibial, a, a profunda angioplasty. Good option now for, is this a good place for a bypass? Ankle ulcer, gets a fem anterior tibial bypass, and heals the ulcer over about six months. This is a composite graft, meaning half of it is synthetic. And you can see that on the left screen, there's kind of a, uh, that's the junction between the PTFE and a vein graft. It goes down, gets a thrombectomy, when the, then what happens? Graft thrombectomy, graft excision with an infected uh, fempop graft, two washouts, a reop for a lymph leak, a stage one amputation about a week ago, and then a final amputation a short time after that. So the point of this is not all bypasses are a good option. This was one that didn't have a good saphenous vein. So I'm going to jump to the end here because I know uh, we want to finish this up. Uh, but I think the, the point of this is that the best CLI trial to me doesn't, doesn't I think it is important to remember that people who have single segment great saphenous veins have the best outcome with bypass surgery as opposed to any other alternative conduit, whether it's arm vein or small saphenous. Uh, other than that, I think it's hard to get too much information out of the, uh, the data that's on the, on the table now in terms of what's your best treatment at this moment in time. So let's go, we'll go on to the last speaker and then we'll get finished up. There you go. There you go. There you go. In the audience, so uh, there will be a discussion. There is one microphone here, and after Peter, after uh, Dimitri's presentation, we will have a chance to opine on what we have heard. All right, perfect. Well, this were a terrific number of uh, presentations, both on endovascular and surgical. I'm going to present a quick case. I guess it's a question mark. Uh, should have the, this case been sent, SFA popliteal case, to endovascular or surgery? And per perhaps I'll ask the panelists and the, and the moderators to comment on some of the questions um, and apply the data as we've seen. No disclosures here? I guess the only disclosure, I'm an interventional cardiologist. I don't know if that's a good thing. Polyvascular patient, we've all seen this patient, some of this were presented, 80-year-old man, history of coronary disease, has had stents, stents failed, then he had cabbage, carotid disease already had left endarterectomy, renal disease had uh, very resistant hypertension in 2011 at an outside institution, had a left renal stent, then did have um, severe lifestyle limiting claudications. We can talk about whether medical management should have been done or, or percutaneous therapy, but he did have a stent uh, in the left SFA in 2011 and then a PTA atherectomy in 2012 and actually has done quite well for about uh, five years uh, with medical management and weight control and uh, risk factor modification. Then in 2017, developed left heel fissure and then an ulcer, was seeing a podiatrist, ID specialist, Clearly a non-healing ulcer, developed resting pain. The ABIs on the left, you can see at rest was 0.6. Uh, there was an exercise ABI done that went down to 0.3. The quick sono showed that the stent in the left SFA was actually patent, but there were diminished velocities in the left popliteal in the presence of collaterals. There was a small vessel disease occluded left posterior tibial. Here are the pictures. Uh, so aorta iliac disease is calcified, but mildly diseased overall. You can see on the left side, uh, it's hard to, to, to see the stent, but overall uh, patent prox to mid uh, calcified SFA vessel with patent stent. And as you come down to the distal SFA and popliteal area, you can start seeing that sort of uh, uh, popcorn calcification that we're all 
um, not happy with. And here you can see diffuse calcification of the popliteal area, collaterals uh, on the left slide, uh, and then hard to see, but certainly some disease at the TP trunk um, and the PT sort of disappears either subtotaled or completely totaled, but uh, not a great runoff as you can see on the right side. So based, I guess, on the data that we've seen, I'll open this to the to the panelists and, and ask the first question, endovascular versus surgical therapy here, and maybe somebody can comment if we do decide on endovascular uh, for this calcified SFA pop disease, should we be thinking uh, stent-free zone? Uh, should we be thinking atherectomy specialty balloon plus minus distal protection, or should we be thinking stents, DCB, uh, BMS, maybe a interwoven stent? And then how much to treat? Certainly SFA popliteal, that, do we need to go down to TP trunk and, and small vessel PT disease? Can you back that slide up by any chance? I don't know if there's a word, maybe the AV, there you go. So the SFA was out completely? Uh, subtotally occluded, it's a, we can still see a little bit of a channel, this popcorn calcification in the mid to distal portion. But the proximal thigh was clean down to that? Correct. Yeah, okay. There's your, what do you guys do? What's your I, best treatment? I think, uh, you know, in this case, does the patient, I mean, how old is the patient again? Seven? I think 80. Okay, yeah, yeah. this is going endo then. Uh, yeah, the chances that it's going to be, I mean, there's not a great, there's a heel ulcer, and there's, so the PT is subtotally occluded down there, so I don't see a great target for a bypass with limited out, uh, outflow. Uh, that being said, it may be to see if they have a good vein and see what their overall surgical, I mean, I think best CLI says, do they have a good vein, do they not? And then speak it in a collaborative approach. Uh, this is going to get, for me, it's going to get probably likely endo, and it's going to be straight line runoff as much as I can to the angiosome of the heel. I think we can get into that PT uh, and try to approach all that. That's probably going to be shockwave to the SFA, uh, maybe a Separa, uh, mainly because you're in a CLI uh, situation, CTLI situation, I think we might be able to get a little more flow down there. Once you get through that, uh, pop a teal, take some third order angiography. Definitely PT, you're going to try to reestablish flow if need be, tack it up. If you have to, put some DES in there as well. Uh, my gut feeling at 80 is probably not going to be the greatest of surgical candidates. So for me personally, it's probably going to go endo. Yeah. Thanks, Drew. I think it's fair to say that if we go around the table, we'll have uh, a few different opinions and, and different treatment options, and, and that speaks to the difficulty of the field and, and, and multiple options that we have. Um, so in this case, um, here's what we did. Um, it was uh, 2017, so this is pre-IVL. So here we just uh, pre dilled the lesion, crossed relatively easily, put a distal filter in. This was an atherectomy case with CSI and finished with a DCB 5-0. Uh, uh, this is sort of the distal um, SFA popliteal area uh, that was treated. The TP trunk and actually the below uh, the knee uh, vessels uh, opened up just with the opening up of the SFA and popliteal. So I left that alone. Um, and patient did quite well for two years. Actually, the wound healed post-intervention. Uh, patient went home on aspirin, clopidogrel, resting ABIs at baseline were 0 0.7. Then two years later, develops left lower extremity toes, skin discoloration. Once again, one uh, first and uh, third toes with resting pain was started on antibiotics by podiatrist. Did a quick ABIs. The left ABI is 0 0.2. Uh, quick sono. Once again, the left distal SFA popliteal area is now occluded, um, diffuse sort of uh, uh, loss of signal below the knee, quick angiogram. We can see there's some restenosis in that proximal SFA um, disease where, where actually there are stents, uh, but the more problematic area is again this popliteal segment that's occluded. So two years later, once again CLI, I guess the same question, although now we have lithotripsy as an option, endovascular versus surgical option, and how would we treat it? I'll take a stab at it. I, I think lithotripsy is going to be great here. Um, now that you have it, um, lithotripsy, DCB, you're probably going to put a stent this time. Um, and a supera would be my choice in that segment, um, 
just because it, it's 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 perfect for the stress of, of the popliteal uh, vessel. Um, but but you have to make sure you can open it. And if you can't open it, then don't put it in. So um, lesion preparation with lithotripsy, you know, plus or minus atherectomy, I suppose. But you know, this patient has what two tibials kind of holding on. So real careful with the atherectomy approach, certainly in, in bulk protection if you do. I, I think the other thing, and I, I would go with two here in person myself, is I think best CLI really uh, Im importantly shows us a high mortality rate. And I think it's important to have those discussions a priori with the family to yeah. the expectations of premeditated resentment. So if they don't know that grandpa is this sick, this is a good time to sit down and just say, by the way, your outcome at a year is 50% chance of having an amputation dead by, th you know, a year X 25%. You know, this is, so everyone has an idea so that when they come in for this, that we all high five each other, oh, this patient's great. And then they have an MI and drop dead at home three months later, that there's yeah. not a shock about this. I think it's important to really underscore how sick these patients are to the family. Yeah, and, and, and to your point, Drew, you know, here it's not going to be a surprise based on sauna what we're going to find. So that upfront discussion, you know, what are the options, surgical versus endovascular, how much to do, et cetera, uh, are done all upfront. This is not a discussion on the table. I, I, Dimitri, I agree with uh, Drew, and I want to just broaden the discussion for the next one or two minutes. That what Peter said and what Drew said is probably where the message is, is that if interventionalist and surgeon can speak with one voice about what this disease is, what are its outcomes, and put it realistically in perspective. I think it'll help a great deal. A lot of the commotion we are hearing, one, of, one major thing is that there is a lot of intermixing of concepts, uh, every leg disease. So I can tell you it is not only not uncommon in lay media and lay individuals, it is also prevalent in the medical community. So everyone may not be as aware as we are about what critical limb ischemia is, what does it entail for the limb, tissue, human being, and overall. So for me, sometimes when I look at best CLI, I am drawn to the 33% three and a half year mortality uh, more than anything else. So Dr. Schneider is absolutely right that we are trying to test a strategy in a patient population that a third of which do not make it to five years. Uh, and I think that that point would really put this entire uh, question into perspective. So there are many thought leaders here, and there are a lot of microphones. They have three or four more minutes, but love to hear what yeah. you guys think. I mean, something we, we didn't answer in best CLI, and we really haven't answered it up till now, is when we do endo, and it works for a period of time, or say it doesn't work at all, and the patient then has to go to subsequent therapies, whether it's more endo, or whether it's a bypass, have we done the patient a disservice? And to me, I, I'm really not sure. You know, there are a lot of things that implicate that, but you don't know if it's just a marker of the disease or if it was maybe if the procedure had been done differently or more completely or whatever up front. And, and the one thing I can point to to say that we could be doing harm is if we're embolizing runoff. And that, that's the one thing that you cannot cross, cannot reproduce, cannot you know, make happen once it's gone. And, and that is if the, obliter if the runoff is obliterated by embolization, so. No, these are excellent points. And, and in this particular case, after the sauna was done and we sort of understood what we're dealing with, you know, a whole team was assembled, the podiatrist, the ID were already involved with this. And then we got the surgeon to, to opine on what the risks of the, of the uh, surgical interventions would be. And patient was already, sort of having these discussions with all of us before the, the actual angiogram and, and the decision to proceed with the um, endo 2, um, which is, um, once again, we cross the lesion here. Um, this is, as I've mentioned, shockwave is now available, and, and you guys have mentioned this, um, treating uh, shockwave, uh, relatively small, 4-0, uh, both popliteal and distal SFA, and then finishing it up with, uh, with the DCB. Um, once again, um, looking at the results, the distal SFA popliteal, pretty good result. There is still a residual uh, TP trunk, at least a moderate disease. I think we can all appreciate that. Uh, decent AT and perineal, the PT sort of subtotally occluded. Um, but clinically, patient uh, had resolution of, of symptoms post-intervention, did quite well for at least a year, I would say. 
and then develop left lower extremity third toe non-healing ulceration. Uh, ABIs once again on the left side at rest 0.2, quick sono once again occluded distal left SFA popliteal artery distal to the stent. Um, once again, we had a discussion among the subspecialties, um, but I'll open it to the discussion here. What this is this is third presentation now. Um, you wonder, could the impairment of the outflow perhaps have played a role in the fact that this intervention didn't last as long as the prior two? Um, honestly, I, th I think that TP trunk lesion, I probably would have hit that with a, with a 4 IVL mm -hmm. and then maybe considered putting in a short drug looting stent. And then the question is, you know, should you have gone after or is there any benefit to going after the PT? again, to try to maximize and improve the runoff. We just don't know the answer to that question, but um, if the decision is to go give it one last hurrah, then I think I would try really hard to get inline flow to the foot through that PT. Yeah, and I think, you know, to your point, interestingly, that every time we treat the SFA popliteal here, or at least twice, you know, the symptoms resolve. It's sort of the history, I guess, repeats itself. Um, so angiogram, not surprising, again, this popcorn calcification was sort of occluded uh, distal SFA popliteal area. Once again, the distal vessels, the TP trunk, you can sort of appreciate still residual, at least moderate disease. We don't see a lot of outflow, but that may be just flow dependent. Um, we talked about, I guess, the options are, are similar, but, but once, uh, once again, very important to have this discussion prior to getting the patient on the table so that they, we don't need to think about the options here. So in this case, as, as was mentioned, we were a little more aggressive. Crossing actually, interestingly, was not a big uh, deal. Delivering uh, the devices was a, was a little bit more difficult. But uh, shockwave here, uh, uh, plain balloon angioplasty of TP trunk. So now um, going a little bit more aggressive, as was mentioned, uh, doing both popliteal, doing both uh, uh, treating TP trunk with the shockwave, with the DCB. Um, and some instant restenosis of, of SFA stents not shown um, with the DCB proximally, more proximally in the mid, mid SFA as well. Um, and this is sort of the result of the SFA. Still not stenting, and we can argue or discuss this whether this is a non stent uh, situation or whether maybe a stenting here, DCB or interwoven stent would have been reasonable. The, the uh, TP trunk is looking a little better. The PT was left alone. Um, and interestingly, um, patient was switched, also more aggressive treatment on clopidogrel and rivaroxaban now. Um, but the symptoms have resolved, and I guess in this particular case, and I'm not saying this should be every case, um, you know, three was a charm, um, and patient's been asymptomatic for four years now since the last intervention. Did, did you use IVIS for that below the knee stuff? Because I think we, we have pretty good data that we undersize if we don't use IVIS in the BTK sort of, I, I think everywhere, I think we should be using IVIS. I mean, I don't know why we're not doing it in coronaries routinely 100% of the time, and then we should definitely be doing it in the periphery as well. Yeah, no, I agree. In this case, I think this was relatively, you know, a few years back, I wasn't, but now I do. And I think, you know, to your point, the shockwave, um, uh, and the, uh, the devices could have been larger based on the IVA size, and we could have optimized it better, and I absolutely agree. I think IVA's guided treatment would have been ideal. I'm going to ask one other question. I hate to do it, but I'm going to ask it. I, and I've heard over and over, everybody says interwoven stents in the SFA in these compromised situations. Why, is it, why use a nitinol stent ever in the SFA instead of? your interwoven stent, instead of Supera. Why wouldn't Supera be the only stent you'd ever use in the leg? I, I'll uh, give my quick opinion. I, I think you're right. I think we don't have a lot of data, whether it's interwoven versus uh, a regular nitinol or, or DES for that matter. I don't think we have good randomized comparisons. Um, I think putting a DES in the SFA popliteal here would have been reasonable. I think, you know, uh, anecdotally we like it, but I don't. I, I agree. We don't have the data to back that up. Uh, I agree. I, but it's a great question, and I think um, some of it's technical. Um, it's 
I'm pretty good at Superas, but I'm I'm not confident landing yeah. at the OS of the SFA. You know, yeah. for example. A amen. Um, okay. And um, I I think it's a harder stent to deploy. And I think people are averse to using stents that are a little technically more challenging. You have to spend a lot more time with lesion prep, um, which is important because that stent is a great stent when it's deployed at its nominal length, but it's not great if if you don't do a good job prepping and you end up lengthening it significantly. We know that from the data. Um, but it's a it's a good stent. It's a great stent in the in the popliteal, the proximal popliteal, the adductor. You know, so. yeah, it should be a head head stunt. I mean, the data in terms of patency for longer lesions, I think, is probably best with drug looting stents. And quite frankly, I mean, I, it's important to remember that if a patient does have good runoff, there's also pretty darn good data for for covered stents. You know, there's a lot of Viabon data out there. Again, Dr. Aid and his colleagues, I think, have really shown us the way that you can get very, very good long-term primary patency rates, even in very long occlusions, um, if we size the vessels properly. And why did, why were the results so much better from Japan than they were from the U.S.? And I think it's because of IVIS. And it was mandated in the Vanquish study uh, and in the in initial IDE studies with Viabon. Um, the results were really excellent for, you know, long lesions over 20 centimeters. Um, provided that the patient had at least one good tibial runoff. So, you know, that's another option. And the other big advantage of a stent graft is you can really land it better than any other self-expanding stent out there in terms of nailing the ostium. And we haven't even talked about detour, but that's going to be another option that's actually now available now that it's been FDA approved. So I suspect that at this meeting next year we'll be talking about that a lot more than we're talking about it right now. Well, it, as a, a non-cardiologist, it strikes me that the variability in terms of how we all treat these legs uh, is substantially higher than the variability in coronary disease. Wouldn't you say that if you presented similar cases, coronary lesions, you'd have a pretty good idea of what to do? In the periphery, it's, a, it's an open field with lots of options, and everybody has very strong opinions. So those of you who are starting this uh, uh, adventure... It's a, it's a lifelong of learning, that's for sure. And I, I really enjoyed this morning's session. I learned a lot from everybody. I thought you did a great job of presenting the cases and the, the various different options. And I guess we have a lunch that's set up here now, and uh, we'll break and uh, come back this afternoon. Thank you, everybody.